Would you be able to give me your name and your job title, please? Uh, kia ora, my name is Peter McGlashan. Um, I, what is my job? I often wear a couple of different hats, but it doesn't really matter which hat I'm in. I'm normally stirring up the pot and trying to shake things up. Uh, I work at a university, AUT University in New Zealand, and I'm also a local body politician. Um, yeah, being a cricketer with a thick skin from being sledged all my life has come in quite handy in politics. Well, I mean, I saw you fight, uh, you know, having a go at Tim Payne yesterday, but don't worry, we won't. Uh, I won't. I won't. Uh, I won't have, um, bring that one back up. Uh, There's a talk great about Zealand... story, so we should we should chat about that. He actually rocked up and he fronted up. So I, I missed it. You deleted the tweet. So what tweet did you send to Tim Payne? Oh, it was about. I mean, New Zealand had just won the World Test Championship for the first time. Um, you know, the whole of New Zealand was celebrating. And Tim Payne, obviously, a few days before the World Championship final, had said, look, India are going to win this easy. They're going to win comfortably over the Black Caps. Um, and so as, you know, I got a bit carried away in the moment, and I, <laughs> and I tweeted uh, Tim Payne and said, um, you know, I tagged him and I said, is there any chance you'd be willing to come on the radio to talk about the um, COVID outbreak in New South Wales? Because New Zealand has had to go into lockdown because of all these filthy Australians that have come over <laughs> as part of the bubble. Um, and having a bit of a dig. And to his credit, he, you know, went along with the joke and he said, yeah, I'm available any time, which kind of called my bluff. Um, so I flicked him a, I followed him and he followed me and I flicked him a direct message and I said, look, thanks so much for playing along, mate. Like, you know, sorry, it was a bit cheeky. Um, but, you know, there's a few Kiwis that um, got a bit riled up about what he said. And he said, mate, no, nah, no, no problem at all. Um, I'd be more than happy to come on the radio and eat some humble pie. So, you know, I said to the guys at News Talk who had just been doing the broadcasting, look, the te- the Australian test captain is actually willing to come on and, and eat some humble pie. So, um, yeah, so he came on New Zealand radio uh, only a couple of hours ago and uh, was really gracious and, and kind of gave a really fascinating insight into what Australia's attitudes was towards the final, the frustrations of having missed out on that final by a slow overrate and the penalty that came from it. Um, so, yeah, he's a... I'd heard that he was a good dude, and I'm sure he's won over some Kiwi hearts um, after fronting up, which was pretty cool. I cannot believe that we are here to do the victory lap of New Zealand cricket, and we've started by talking about Australia. That is the most New Zealand cricket thing that's ever happened. <laughs> oh, I mean, the victory lap, wow. It's taken a while to get here, and I think you know, everyone's appreciated here in New Zealand the, um, the piece that you did. I think it was on Crick Info about you know the journey to get here and Yeah, there's been a lot of heartbreak being a New Zealand cricket fan for a long time, and it feels pretty good. We did win the Champions Trophy. Um, A lot of these players probably weren't born when that trophy was won, or (laughs) or they were pretty young when it happened, Uh, and it does feel a long time ago. So, yeah, it's been a pretty special week there for sure. Yeah, I mean, it's so long ago, the Champions Trophy wasn't called the Champions Trophy, and it was when we played cricket in Kenya. It is a ridiculous (laughs) long period. The world was a different place. Exactly. I want to go back to kind of the start of this journey. Um, obviously, we're not going to go all the I'm not going to, you know, ask you too many questions about Stewie Dempster or Martin Donnelly, although I'm sure you're an expert and you've got their stats right in the top of your head. But we're going to go back to sort of the start of this journey. And I see it as it was, I think there was a lot of people. I was very angry at the time. Ross Taylor was captain of New Zealand. Brendan McCullen made a power play, essentially, to take over the role. Brendan McCullen was in runnings to become the captain beforehand and didn't impress at the, at the interviews. I remember that being the big rumor at the time. Uh, him and Mike Hessen, though, decided that he was going to be a b- better leader. That wasn't a, that wasn't a bloodless cl- coup, was it? I mean, that was quite a messy situation, what happened with Ross Taylor, who is, is going to be a le- was already going to be a legend of New Zealand cricket, but even more so now. Yeah, I mean, it was a fascinating time for New Zealand cricket. and. Um, you know, I'd played for the New Zealand side um, a few years before that, and it had almost been a revolving door of coaches which led up to that. Um, you know, Andy Moles was coach for a while. There was a while where Dan Vittori was basically coach captain. Uh, John Wright, I think, had been captain before Mike Hesson came on board. Um, and you had the situation where Mike Hesson's arrival as coach kind of meant that he didn't fit with the captain who had been previous under the previous coach. Mike Hesson, former Otago um, stalwart. I mean, Mike Hesson was in charge of the development program when I was playing 
uh, on the solitary year that I played for Otago. And so him and Brendan McCullum were really tight. They knew what how to get the best out of each other. Um, and so when Hessen came uh, became coach, personally looking at it from the outside, I, you always got the sense that there was this uncomfortable tension between the fact that he Taylor probably wasn't the captain that um, Hessen would have chosen. And so there was this, yeah, this weird interview process, I think, from memory. Um, uh, I think the fact that it happened while they were overseas, I think, from memory, they were touring, I think it was Sri Lanka. And, you know, there was this real sense that Ross had been betrayed um, and this this kind of, this situation had been almost manufactured to allow this thing to happen at a time when, you know, Taylor was vulnerable, I guess, being away from home and McCullum was seen as an opportunist. Um, I don't know what the truth is. You know, I don't know how much of that was, was orchestrated or whether it was actually always kind of the thing that should have happened because he's wanted the captain that he needed um, with his mm. style. Um, and it's not the first version of the, you know, the drama that got us there. You know, things weren't rosy, uh, and it actually took more than that coup to get New Zealand on the path where they've got to today. It took that horrendous test match against South Africa where, you know, New Zealand were at the bottom of the barrel and the only way was to affect some change. And, uh, you know, that really was the rebirth of the Black Caps um, into the form that we've seen it today. Yeah, I mean, it's it sort of those, those two things sort of almost meld together at a certain point. But there's that little bit in the middle that isn't talked about much now, which is that Brendan McCullum kind of had to pull the players back from from franchise leagues and had to get players to recommit to New Zealand. Also, New Zealand cricket had to be quite honest and uh, and say, well, we're not going to be able to stop these players going to the IPL. Like a lot of little micro things happened around that. Um, Brendan McCullum is obviously someone that you, you know a, a lot better than I do, but it feels like if Brendan McCullum stands in a room and says to a bunch of blokes, we are not doing this right, especially if he's being honest and he was saying um, a similar thing himself, we're not playing the game the right way. We're not committing to New Zealand cricket the right way. Um, uh, you know, once once someone like that does that, and, you know, Ross Taylor was probably a leader by example more than a leader by, you know, a vocal leader in that sort of way. Once McCullum does that, is that sort of the slap in the back of the head that maybe a few senior players kind of needed at that point? Yeah, it's interesting because, um, you know, I've, I first came across Brendan when he was about 15 or 16, I think, um, under-17 national tournament. I think he was 14 and everyone else was 17 or 18. Like you could tell that he was young, brash and confident. And our fast bowler bowled a short ball and he hooked it off his nose like he was Lim and Martin Crow, and everyone was just like, okay, that's handy for a kid his age. Let's put some fielders back in for, and he does it again. Sure enough, fearless. Took it off his nose, but straight to the fielder. And we reminded him of that as he walked off and almost every other time that we saw him for the next couple of years because he was compulsive and he had absolute belief in the decisions that he made were the right ones. And there's a lot of New Zealand cricketers that have been like that over the years where to get to the top, they had to be ruthless and they had to have an absolute belief in themselves. I think it's something that runs quite commonly in sport. But that, that comes with its ups and downs. You know, It doesn't always work out well. But I think it was almost Brendan McCullum going through a, a reinvention which allowed the rest of the team to be reinvented. And you know, the Brendan McCullum that probably sat there after that day where they were bowled out for 40 odd or whatever it was, it was almost just about, it was almost as much about him reinventing himself, mm. which then allowed the rest of the team to follow. Because the team had always followed him, be it having a cigarette at the bar or a drink when they shouldn't have been or whatever the thing that Brendan was dulling, doing, you ran through brick walls for Brendan because he was that sort of guy. You knew that he was special and he was going to end up in a situation where no one else had predicted. Um, only Brendan could have got you there. And that's the way that he played the game. He, he went out and opened as if he had a plane to catch. Um, but it took him to do that self-reflection and actually say, I'm not getting the best out of myself probably, which then allowed the rest of the team to kind of jump on that wagon and say, look, if Brendan's going to reinvent himself and actually commit to this change, then it's probably something we can probably all do because, you know, if he does something, he normally uh, he's normally worth following. And you kind of got the sense that if he was willing to 
kind of change his ways and be a bit more respectful and and acknowledge that balance between risk and return, mm. then the New Zealand team was kind of probably going to be better off. And it took him to kind of reinvent himself to get us to that 2015 World Cup to then lay the groundwork for other people to then come in and and build on that. Um, and that was Kane and Gary Stead and all the changes that came. But there's a level of consistency that this New Zealand team shows now, which has never really existed in New Zealand cricket because it's often only been individuals leading. It's been a Richard Hadley or a Glenn Turner that has kind of carried the team. Mm. Whereas I think kind of after McCullum's reinvention, it allowed everyone that ability to believe that every single person in the change room could be world-class, not just the one or two who had been chosen. Um, yeah, it's something that someone needs to dig into at some stage because it'll be fascinating to know whether other sports in New Zealand could learn from it, I reckon. Well, I mean, I, it's funny. I was talking to a couple of people in cricket during the test match and they were saying, if New Zealand win this, will a bunch of cricket teams around the world start to poke their noses into what New Zealand cricket has done from sort of the ground up? And I said, probably not, because everyone will just assume that it was a bit of a fluke and, and move on from it. But clearly it's not. The 2015 World Cup, uh, you know, obviously Mitchell Stark kind of ruins that in, in the first over. But up until that point... Um, it was quite clear that something was there, but it wasn't. It wasn't the first time that New Zealand sort of limited overs cricket had been dynamic or had been interesting before. And there'd been that period. I think was it under might have been under John Bracewell when they'd actually thought about becoming a white ball sort of specialist team for a little while, and they talked about that. I think that might have been around your era, maybe just slightly before your era when they were talking about that. So it wasn't that surprising when New Zealand got good in the 2015 World Cup. How did that then transform into test um, uh, success, do you think? Well, I think the challenge that New Zealand cricket has always had is the sense of um, we do, we're, we're, too, we're too small to compete on the global stage. We have to choose one form to be good at at any one time. We couldn't possibly be good at all forms in the same kind of 12 to 24-month window. And so often when the New Zealand contracts were coming out, it would be a case of, right, we've got a World Cup next year, all the money, all the resources, all the training is going to go into getting that 50-over team ready. And then a couple of years later, there'd be nothing else on, and so it would be tests. And you'd think, oh, we've got a big tour to England coming up. All the money this year is going to go into the test players. And what that did is led to this real seesaw back and forth of talent and you can't keep those players and Chris Martin's valuable this year, but he's not valuable next year. And, you know, you'd have years where our, our test batting openers and our test bowlers would disappear off the radar because you just wouldn't see them at training camps. They'd be, you know, off in the back blocks of wherever practicing by themselves because the white ball was the, pro the priority for that kind of 24 month window. Um, but I think again, going back to why that, that change from McCullum was important. It became more about the values of New Zealand cricket in general, and it became about whatever forms we're playing, be it T20s or one days or tests, there's a New Zealand way now. Rather than copying the Australians and being, you know, overtly aggressive or copying the, you know, another side with the type of player that they create, this kind of um, rebranding and this, this essence of what being a Kiwi cricketer was flowed through all the formats. You know, we, we played test cricket aggressively. We played T20s innovative uh, with innovation. We were willing to kind of fight right to the last wicket. Um, you know, gone were the days where the tail order would just fall over. BJ Watling would be there battling to the very end. Um, but it took a long time. It also, and I think we can't underestimate what Mike Hesson did because, like I said, for a while, the coaching role was a revolving door, which meant, again, mm. every time a coach comes in, new ideas, new teams, new selectors, whereas Hess for the first time in probably 20 years of New Zealand cricket created a level of stability with selection policies and processes and styles, which has allowed New Zealand cricket, I guess, the, the opportunity to, to mature. Because a lot of those players have matured. I mean, you, you did an excellent analysis on Tim Southey and how his game has matured. You know, I have no doubt that the, the stability that uh, Hesson and McCullum provided allowed players like Tim Southey to unpack and and almost leave behind the youth and get to a place where they could actually get the best out of themselves. 
And then the next step is, so, I mean, if you talk about McCullum and Hassan were a partnership and then you have, you know, Kane and Gary Steed becoming a partnership. Now, it, I mean, it's a hilarious situation in this uh, World Test Championship final where one of the coaches is Ravi Shastri, one of the most famous people in cricket, uh, you know, former commentator, player, legend. And the other side is Gary Steed, who could literally walk down the street uh, in almost any cricket country in the world and no one would know who he is. That seemed to me, I, I remember at that stage, it seemed so seamless, the change, the change over there. Um, is that just because, is that the sort of person Gary Steed is? I mean, he's just not that well known sort of outside of New Zealand cricket culture. Yeah, well, even the fact that you're pronouncing it Steed says that you, you haven't, like, it's, it's steady as in steady. Like, that's how you can remember it. He is just so steady. He is literally Gary Stead. Um, he is a guy who, and Craig, uh, Craig Cumming, who I was doing the radio commentary, uh, did a re- highlighted some really good things that I hadn't recognised before, is that um, both Mike Hesson and Gary Stead are career coaches. Um, yes, Gary Stead played for the New Zealand, played for the Black Caps, but actually he was, and um, you know, I'm going to put, Craig's name at the bottom of this because he told me all this the other night. <laughs> um, he was director of Canterbury High Performance or something at 23 years old while he was playing. Again, going back to that amateur part of New Zealand cricket, while mm. Gary Stead was playing for Canterbury, he was also director of coaching at like 23, 24 years old. Uh, Mike Hesson was the same. Mike Hesson, you know, um, didn't have, I'm not even sure, he might have played a couple of first class games, but he was a coach at a really young age, you know, and um, so both of them followed a very similar path. So it's really interesting that Hesson kind of got to the to the Everest, you know, got to the top, and then had this guy coming through underneath who with a very similar path. So as you see, that transition was very smooth. But Gary Stead has got to be one of the few guys in the world who has coached both the, the top men's and women's side. Mm. So he was the White Ferns coach a few iterations before he was the Black Caps coach. There's a level of kind of humility and um, and graciousness that comes from a guy who was willing to work his way up through the women's game first uh he was a men's first class coach as well for for the men uh for canterbury as well but you know again the fact that he was willing to put in all the hard yards in the women's game which was severely under resourced in new zealand and still is uh and then you know also work his way up through the black caps uh new zealand coaching system means that he's not a guy that walks in and demands the microphone and and you know wants to compete with Ravi Shastri on a on a name recognition or, or which one of them is more famous. He's steady. He is Gary Stead, and he just steady the ship. Kane Williamson, the captain, steady the coach. It's a, it's. I mean, you couldn't write it. <laughs> I, I just thought that when when New Zealanders were saying that that was a that was just the accent. I didn't realize that was actually how you pronounce his name. No, <laughs> that's it. I mean, it's the accent, but it's but it's yeah, it's um. It's ridiculous, you know, but it's the stars have aligned for Mike Hesson to get the successful run that he did and then a guy very similar to Mike Hesson to come in. And even the way that Hess left, you know, Hess left on his own terms, not because he was getting booted out of the job. Yeah. And so Gary Stead was faced with the choice. Do I come in and, like, really, you know, stamp my mark on this team and make sure that they know that I'm not Mike Hesson, I'm Gary Stead? But instead, he chose to just kind of work with the systems that were already in place, which didn't mean that there was a big kind of swing left or right from what the systems that have been so successful. And it has allowed them to build on the previous um, regime as opposed to dismantle it and try and rebuild it. So, yes, I mean, good fortune, luck, um, good planning. It's hard to know, but it's a pretty, yeah. It's done something that New Zealand's ever done before, so we're pretty happy about that. Yeah, I think one of the other interesting things is, you know, Kane Williamson taking over the captain um, job. You know, he's, you know, probably taken over from Martin Crowe as the best uh, batter that New Zealand cricket has ever had. Uh, Martin Crowe was a genius if, with tactics, but obviously brought his own sort of, uh, you know, personality to it, uh, his own eccentricities. And, I, you know, I could say that I knew Martin pretty well. Uh, I can't imagine what it would have been like to play under him at times. Uh, whereas Kane Williamson, if you didn't know he was a star player, you, you would probably think that he was the fifth batter picked in any side. Um, and it was maybe there because he bowled a little bit of part-time spin. Uh, considering how famous he is in New Zealand um, and how even more famous he is in, in places like India, nothing seems to ever affect him. 
um, in that way. And I'm sure he does. I'm sure internally things go on and, and things frustrate him. But, you know, I, I spent a lot of my career going from press conference to press conference hearing international captains. He just has a calmness to him that is inbuilt. I, I would, and you can see it in his batting and you can see it off the field. Yeah, Kane's um, he's a fascinating – I mean, I feel like saying he's a fascinating kid because I, I met him when he was 13 <laughs> or 14. I was running a um, Northern Knights, the first class team that I was playing for. We used to run kind of master classes for the junior academies, and so my job was to come in and run this master class for our, you know, 14, 15, 16-year-olds around innovation and T20 batting and, you know, because I was playing reverse sweeps and paddle sweeping the fast bowlers. And what I remember of Kane as a 13, 14 year old is he just wouldn't stop asking questions just constantly. Like, you know, there's a dozen kids in this class that I'm trying to teach, and his hand was just constantly and just, what about this? And what if it turns too much? And what if the guy's too fast? And have you ever been hit in the head? And like, it was just like, <laughs> just, shh, there's other people here. This is really embarrassing. But, but that was what he was about. His thirst for knowledge was the thing that had driven him to kind of become this, you know, exceptional talent at a really young age. And then you knew as you started to play more with him as he matured that that was going to be the difference, was the fact that he would never be happy not knowing how he could do whatever he was doing better, be it basketball or surfing or playing the guitar. Like, um, so many great stories about Kane. The humility thing's fascinating. So I think from memory, he's a twin and he grew up in a family of like multiple kids, like maybe three or four kids. Uh, the, you know, there's something about his upbringing. His parents are amazing. Um, I've had a little bit to do with his dad and, um, but it was always just steady on, just settle down, Kane. Don't get too excited, you know, like, you know, just what's the process? How did you get there? How did you play that cover drive? Don't worry about where it went. Yes, it went for four and it was, you know, lauded as the best cover drive ever played by others, but just, you know, cool your jets, just settle down a little bit. And there's something really Kiwi about that. Like it's the ultimate and kind of Kiwi upbringing, I think. And um, it's just held him in really good stead. It doesn't matter what happens in his life. There's a real humility to what he does. Um, you know, I remember the time when he was playing for ND and he was teaching himself to play the guitar, Trent Bolt was an amazing guitarist and um, started bringing his guitar on tour. And so Kane had to learn off Trent. It probably happened over the course of a weekend while they were rooming together. I don't know. But whatever Kane picked up and wanted to know, the videos of him and um, David Warner playing darts in the IPL, like that's so Kane. That's so <laughs> Kane. See someone, someone else doing something, curious as to how it works, picks it apart. His problem when he got called for chucking, that was purely because he wanted to learn how to bowl a douche. So he spent like ages like getting his elbow further and further around to a point where he could bowl it. But what he'd done is he'd got himself into trouble where he was now chucking the ball and he had to kind of retro, you know, go back to his old ways. Yeah. But yeah, just a thirst for knowledge means that the guy, he could get better, which is pretty scary. Well, I mean, it's interesting when you look at the Fab Four, Stephen Smith obviously had Sam Papergate and as good a batter as he is, and he's quite clearly the best uh, with the bat of the, of the four of those guys, there's, there's clearly maybe not the best in leadership. Um, you know, he's not a natural in, in those sorts of things. Virat Kohli is a, a natural leader and a great, great with the bat, but maybe tactically gets a little bit, you know, um, especially in the IPL, you could see that he's not one of the, you know, the, the be better captains tactically. Joe Root has gone through, you know, just a, a dips with the bat. Kane Williamson has sort of been the one who has managed to continue to make runs, to be very good as a tactical leader, but also be very good as a, what would you say the other side is, like an emotional leader uh, with, within the team. Is, is, that, is that easier to do? Because the other three are in the, big, the three biggest cricket markets. Is it easier for Kane to sort of do some of those things because he, he can still have a normal life, whereas the other three really can't? Yeah, that's a fascinating observation. I don't know if it's any easier or whether or not he it comes easier to him. Yeah. Um, he, you know, he can, he's just a normal dude. You know, watching the test match, um, Virat Kohli's emotions were just, you know, like, and, and what comes with that is a sense of the team ride with those emotions. And Brendan McCullum was a little bit like that as a captain as well. 
Um, and I, I really get the feeling that um, Coley's excitability and and moodiness actually affected the Indian team. They didn't stay in the fight for as long as I thought they would because when the, it got a bit tough and Coley started almost to sulk, you kind of got the sense that the team went with that. It reminds me of, um, I can't remember the basketball coach, but um, there's been some famous kind of basketball coaches who talk about the fact that their emotions are just flat yeah. because they need their players to look over to the sidelines and know that the coach is in control. He's not scared by the position that they're in. He's not worried that they're too far down on the scoreboard. Um, and Kane's like that as a captain. You know, you, you could never read whether Kane is concerned or excited or whatever the emotion which most human beings would be feeling. Can't tell with Kane. And so that provides a level of confidence in the rest of the group that, well, if Kane's not worried, then we probably don't need to worry. That's all right. Mm. I was concerned when he got named captain. I thought this kid is going to be New Zealand's best ever. He doesn't need the burden of captaincy. Um, what effect will it have on his performance? Now, as we've seen, it hasn't seemed to have any effect on his performance. I think he's got a better record as captain than he did when he when then he wasn't. Um, so it seems to have been good for his game. Only he knows whether it's been good for him and the extra burden that that provides. You know, his, he's very private about his family. Um, who knows whether the captaincy has, away from the game, has provided an extra level of stress or, or um, that, that we don't see on the park because he does have that ability to kind of keep a poker face on the park. Maybe that's the beard covering some of the micro expressions. But um, I'm pleased that it's gone as well from hit as it has because, as you said, you know, Joe Root seems to have struggled with it. Um, Coley, the effect of Coley has, a, has an influence on the rest of the team. And Steve Smith has obviously faced some, you know, some struggles, which hasn't necessarily affected his batting, but has led to him no longer being the test captain. Um, so, yeah, so far, so good for Kane. Uh, the other thing, it was so early. If you make him captain then, how long is he going to be captain for? You know, yeah. like he's probably got another eight or nine years left. Does he captain for the, all of that? Or does someone else come in? And if, But, you know, it's not a bad problem to have. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it'd be really interesting if, if it ever ties him out or emotionally he's just like, you know, I've done the job. And, and might also depend on, you know, uh, next generation and, and who is coming through. Um, you know, there's some interesting cricketers like Tom Latham coming through at the moment where they might think, you know, there, there's a definite leadership potential with someone like him. I want to talk about the more technical stuff. We talked about the people. We you know, basically talked about the four people, I think, uh, who are most involved with, with what's happened. Around, and I've, I, forgot, I forgot what year it was, was it around 2006 or 2008, the pitches in Plunkett Shield were changed. Was that, was that from a sort of communal chat uh, within um, New Zealand cricket? Was that you know, player-driven? Was that management-driven? Because they went from what we think of as a New Zealand pitch, which is you know, l luminescent green, um, to brown pitches, essentially. I mean, I, I, I think I called them in, in one of my articles. They're, they're kind of more like Australian drop-in pitches now, whereas in the old days, they were carpet. Yeah, it's interesting. I, um, I'm not sure of the timing. I, I definitely think um, the strength of the Players Association and we brought in a, what they call a warrant of fitness system where basically there's a checklist of things that the ground needs to have to get first-class cricket. We used to play first-class cricket in tiny little towns around New Zealand, which that, sometimes that was the only big sporting event they had come to town. And so they used to put on a great spread and... There's a great one uh, that's like built in. It's like built into a mountain or something with like the CT on the side, and it's like it looks like a club ground. And I, when I found out it was a first class ground, it was absolutely brilliant. I wouldn't want to be a first class cricketer to play there, but it looked it looked very pretty. Oh, you ask any cricketer in New Zealand, and Pukekura Park, the one you're talking about, will that's be one of, yep. one of their favorite one of their favorite grounds ever. It's also this. Um, it was used for the filming of The Last Samurai with Tom Cruise in it. So they use. <laughs> I did not know. They that. use. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So get out the Last Samurai. Watch the Last Samurai, and you'll see all these battle scenes where the archers are preparing for battle, and it's on the cricket ground. Like they closed the cricket ground for like six or seven months while they filmed it. So Pukekura Park, for anyone that hasn't seen the pictures, um, is 
not much bigger than a postage stamp. Uh, and each side of the ground has these these terraces cut into it, um, where you where the spectators sit. And it, I've played um, what they call Hawk Cup games, which is like a district association, which is like small, minor provincial, uh, minor county in, in the UK, the equivalent, um, where there's only 15 or 20 people in the crowd. But it sounds like there's 500 because of these big terraces and they're right on top of you. Um, it's a spectacular place to play. They played a World Cup game there in 1992. I think at the time it was the highest ever runs tally scored in a uh, one-day game. I think it was something like 300 plays, 300 or something. I think Zimbabwe might have played there. Um, you know, so you, the it's not a game somewhere. you want to be a bowler, is it? It's a, it's a tiny, oh, no. tiny. It's, it's, it's a like tiny a, little it's tiny for a set. club ground, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. But, um, but I mean, New Zealand, we have lots of those types of grounds because cricket wasn't um, – a huge sport here. I mean, you see it whenever we play internationals, you know, Eden Park is a mm. strange tiny ground because it's a dual purpose. We have a lot of dual purpose grounds in New Zealand uh, to save on costs, I guess. And yeah, so, and you know, uh, another one is in Masterton, Queen Elizabeth. Um, so they still play at Pukukura Park. It's got, a, it ticks all the boxes with the Warner Fitness. Um, another one that I played at growing up, uh, first class cricket was Queen Elizabeth Park in Masterton. And um, interesting thing about Queen Elizabeth Park and Masterton is on either side of the pitch, it was croquet greens when you're not playing cricket. So you barely had to touch it. And the cricket ball just raced across the outfield like it was on, like it was on glass. Um, so you combine a tiny boundary and a croquet green on either side of the pitch, and that's a high-scoring ground. Um, but when the Warren of Fitness came in, a lot of those smaller towns didn't reach the bar. And mm. so um, there was this, and, and the ones that did, all of a sudden were scared, I guess, of losing cricket. And so you ended up with this really safe surface to play on because they were scared about a team getting rolled for 170 or something on a green seamer or playing on a surface which broke up and turned too much because they were worried that they were going to lose Top level cricket. So you you did, and so you did kind of go through this phase where a lot of the grounds in New Zealand ended up much of a muchness. There was this kind of, you know, the same turf advisors would go around all the country, and you know they almost they all had the same recipe book to bake their pitches, and they all ended up with the same kind of stock standard, you know, safe surface, which for a long time meant it it was bloody hard for fast bowlers to bowl in New Zealand because you'd gone from this kind of bowler friendly scenario to something which was just gave you nothing. But it was good for our batters. It did allow a generation of New Zealand batters who had before that found it really tough going. Um, again, you, you, I feel like I'm praising you almost too much in this. Your, your piece around the openers in New Zealand and the, oh. the Blairs and, you know, the fact that for so long being an opener in New Zealand was so hard. That shift to a more... Um, uh, more demure surface to bat on meant that openers actually had a chance. And so we did actually start to get a generation of batters come through who could bat at the top level, bat for long periods of time, which has probably given the Kane Williamson's kind of, you know, 10, 15 years later, the building blocks to then compete internationally. Because before then, it was pretty rare for a New Zealand batsman to be any good um, because they just weren't used to batting that long. We used to, mm. I mean, when you'd hear these stories of the scores in Australia, of you know, guys like Matthew Hayden and that, or Matthew Elliott going back to um, State Shield stuff and getting, you know, 370, you know. I, when Kane, I think the first time Kane Williamson got a double hundred, it was like none of us had ever played in a game where a guy got a double hundred before, you know. It's just New Zealand batsmen just weren't used to being able to bat that long. Um, but I think that change of surface, while it did kind of make the game pretty boring here for about a decade, it did kind of lay the groundwork for a generation of batters to come through who had, um, who understood how to bat long periods and, and actually had some experience of it. And I suppose the other side of that is that generally test pitches are better than first-class pitches as a general rule because there's more money in, in test venues. Um, they're for five days, so they have to last longer. You know, all those little things. So... 
it sounds like an almost an accidental thing where the pitchers started mimicking more what t- what test pitches were around the world rather than a than a on purpose thing. But that also helps the bowlers because they now have to work out how to get wickets on flat pitches. Yeah, so I mean, you're right to a degree. I mean, they didn't get that good. Um, that the, you had the pace and bounce of a test surface, that's for sure. Uh, they they were, I guess, they ended up kind of a little bit like a third or fourth day test surface where. It was true most of the time. You didn't have the energy that you'd get from sort of a second or third day surface. But you're right. You know, guys like Hamish Marshall had better test batting averages than they did first class batting averages because when Hamish Marshall went up to play for New Zealand, as you say, he was playing on better surfaces that actually suited his game. The pace came on. He was good behind square, both hook and pull. His game suited playing off the back foot. He'd come back to first class cricket and end up on this kind of, you know, horror surface and get found out by a delivery which he would never have to face at test level so there was definitely a generation of players in New Zealand who actually had better fortune when they made the step up than they did back playing domestic cricket um yeah I think it's a it's a good observation you know the the bowlers had it good for too long um we've never developed the fast bowlers you know again because the surfaces didn't really encourage you to bowl fast um, but it's only in the last 10 years that we've had the Lockie Fergusons, the, the, the Milnes, um, those types of guys come through probably because the surfaces have allowed them to bowl quicker. And it seems like then there was a real sort of um, matchup, I suppose, of what of Mike Hessen's vision really, which is this sort of, there was a lot of role definition within New Zealand cricket at that point. There was a lot of, uh, you know, if one player goes out, we're going to find a similar kind of player to come in and do that role or, you know, uh, thinking about it, which is not how New Zealand cricket had been before. It had been throwing in a lot of teenagers um, and hoping that one of them uh, popped or a lot of guys like, you know, the Blairs that we talked about before, you know, bringing them in and going, oh, hopefully one of them will do better than they've ever done in first class cricket. Under Hessen, that, that really seemed to change. And then, you know, going coming forward, that, that has happened. How much of that is also involved with the stronger sort of uh, New Zealand A um, setup that there has been over the last couple of years? It seems like everyone is planning together for the first time in New Zealand cricket. Yeah, I think that's a good observation. Um, you know, definitely during my uh, time playing for New Zealand, you did get the sense that the selectors were always looking to find the next big talent. And they almost wanted to kind of front the press conference to say, look what I've discovered. I've discovered this player that no one else had seen coming. Um, yes, he's only 19 or 20, and Noah's track record isn't that great. But um, watch this space because he's going to be the next big thing. And so you had, again, revolving door of players where after very little first-class experience, um, they'd get thrust to the front. Uh, the number of t- t- you know, test openers that we've had, the number of wicket keepers that we've used. I mean, we had one tour. Um, the New Zealand A team was in India. We were in Chennai. Um, Gareth Hopkins and I were both in the team. Um, and then they named the Black Caps team during the Indian side, and we both got called up. Gareth, I was the Black Caps T20 keeper. Gareth Hopkins was the Black Caps ODI keeper. We were going to Sri Lanka to meet the test team where Rhys Young was the test keeper. All the while, Brendan McCullum was in the team as well. Um, and it wouldn't have surprised me actually if BJ Watling was maybe opening the batting in that test. So you had this situation where something like five out of the six domestic first-class keepers in New Zealand were all in Sri Lanka. And we joked about the guy who hadn't made the trip <laughs> because it's kind of like... There's no wicket keepers left in New Zealand now. We're all here. We've all had a crack at the New Zealand stuff. And it wasn't good for any of us. I mean, some of us, you know, did better than others financially out of it. But, it, you know, it didn't it didn't help any of us to get kind of thrust in early or as a late replacement or under the proviso that, you know, you should really enjoy your time with the New Zealand team because you won't be here for long because, you know, that guy that you've replaced who was already the second string guy is um, coming back from injury. This revolving door of talent didn't, hasn't helped New Zealand cricket. There's a lot of people that have played for the Black Caps. Um, but I think Hessen brought in, as you say, a system of talent identification where and a, and a belief as a coach that um, we've got to, if we believe in that person, we've got to actually give them a chance to be successful. 
And that has meant that there's probably been, you know, a handful of players that played longer for New Zealand than, you know, the talkback callers would have wanted. Yeah. Um, you know, people have held on to spots where the people calling radio sport were baying for blood and change. And under Hessen, it was like, no, no, we're going to trust the process. Um, we don't think anyone else has done anything yet in domestic cricket to say that this isn't the person we should be using. And that allowed the rest of the team to kind of bond and build and perform to the point that you weren't carrying that person. In days gone by, the team was changed so much that when those players were still in the team, it really was a bit of a burden. But mm. because there was so much stability in the New Zealand team under Hessen, it didn't matter if one or two guys were having a bad day because the other guys were performing. And so you could paper over the cracks. Australia have done it for decades. You know, there's plenty of Australian players who have played a little bit longer than they probably should have because the rest of the team was so bloody good that um, you didn't mind if, you know, that guy wasn't getting wickets or that person wasn't getting runs because you were still winning games. And that, I think, for me, was kind of the legacy that Hessen has built into this team. And as long as they can kind of hold on to that um, level of loyalty, um, it'll benefit those that are there and it'll probably benefit the performances of the team as a whole. And I suppose the other big change is that the overall level of talent got improved by the Southern African players coming in. And it's not just the guys who we know who are in the, in the team. Like, um, I think I was, I was writing about Obeas Pinar recently, who's an incredible talent from South Africa who didn't even make it um, through the New Zealand setup. So I know that there must be a lot of guys sort of at that level who came over, who improved club cricket, who improved the, you know, first class and all that sort of stuff. That, that, that is a big help, but that wouldn't have happened if you didn't have a professional setup for these guys to come over and, and have the opportunity to have a job as well. Yeah, that's a, that's a fascinating one. So when you flick me kind of some of the topics you were thinking about, you know, the South African players effect, and it's kind of like, oh, I guess so. But it, it is something that we've always been conscious of, I guess, in my time playing, is that this this constant flow of cricketers from South Africa stealing our jobs and all that stuff. But um, it, when I started to think about how many it was, you know, I think Grant Elliott was the first. He's the first that I can remember, at least. Certainly but the first had, successful one, yeah. Yeah, but then you had, um, but about the same time, not long after, you had Johan Myberg who came yeah. over uh, and has gone over and played county cricket and done really well. Kruger van Veik came over. Um, then you had Neil Wagner. And then you also had um, a generation of players who, um, they came for other reasons. So those guys all came yeah. for their cricket. They had played in South Africa they maybe hadn't done as well as they want, or they hadn't been picked, not so much they hadn't done as well, but they hadn't been picked for the teams that they wanted to. So they came to New Zealand as a kind of a preformed package and wanted to come here and play international cricket. And, you know, it just so happened that they'd, wanted, they'd have a fern on their shirt instead of a pro tier. But there's also like dozens of players who came off the back of apartheid and changes in, in the safety or, or just wanting a better life. Their families came when they were young um, which is the Kachopa brothers and Glenn Phillips and Colin Munro mm. and Colin de Gronholm coming from Zimbabwe. And we joke about in New Zealand about the North Shore of Auckland being like pr mini Pretoria, but like the North Shore of Auckland is just full of South Africans. And the schools over there and New Zealand in general has had this flow of South African cricketers come through. Many of those, those ones that I mentioned that second time around, they've arrived as seven, eight, nine, ten, twelve yeah. year olds. And so they have had to go through the New Zealand system. So, you know, we can claim a little bit of influencing them. No, definitely. Um, well Glenn Phillips as, and BJ Watling. Yeah. Yeah, well BJ Watling came over from um South Africa when his uh, when he was young with his mum and and grew up in Tokoro, which is a small um yeah. Timbuk town. Um so the, there's the there's both. There's the Dem and yeah. Conways of the world that have come as a preformed version, and we've benefited from what they learned in South Africa and Grant Elliotts, etc. And then there's the other ones that have come to live here for different reasons, and we've benefited, I guess, from the DNA, the the hardened kind of attitude that they bring, uh, the sense of competition that they've come from, maybe. But there's a lot of them that have done pretty well, that's for sure. But 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 uh, I mean, there's also just. There's more people like, it, you know, if you're bringing over totally. extra people with other ideas, you know, has to help. Um, I'll, I'll wrap this up because I've had you on for quite a while now. But what do you specifically think that 
this this will do this win will do for new zealand cricket is you know how big of a deal was it back there and is it you know because it was in england and the wrong time zone and everything and if half the country or most of the country was asleep is it going to have a, a big big uh, everlasting uh, you know uh, effect on new zealand cricket uh it's so hard to know i mean we all hoped that hosting the 2015 cricket world cup was going to be that yep. catalyst that would um put cricket at least kind of semi close to what rugby is in this country um it did while the tournament was on but i'm not sure that we cricket as a sport um capitalized on hosting the tournament um maybe if we'd won it it might have changed things but you did get the sense that everyone loved what the players did during the tournament um but without winning the title at the end it kind of ended up a little bit hollow um this has just been like plugging back in the life support for a lot of fans like there are so many fans who've had their hearts broken 2015 you know flown over to the final lost feel that they're the burden on society because if they hadn't gone to this final we would have won because <laughs> you know and then people that watch the 2019 world cup and just the heartbreak of the tie and then this bet the kiwi ben stokes smacking it with his bat and the overthrows and the you know, and then the count back and no one really knowing that the count back was even in the rule book. And, but to have actually got here in this game, there's so many elements to this game, you know. This was two countries that, that colonial Britain had ruled. You know, India and New Zealand on English soil, taking the, the, the trophy, the mace back. Um, you know, there's, there's that element, there's the... There's the fact that the conditions, it's almost like the stars aligned. You know, if there was any room mm. in the world that New Zealand would want to play a final on a neutral venue, it's the it's in English, English conditions because it's so similar to New Zealand. Who would you want to play if you're, you know, India are the biggest, you know, one and a half billion people. But if you, again, if you picked somewhere where India didn't want to play, it's probably New Zealand and England because of the conditions. So, you know. We're pretty lucky. It would have been nice if it would have been at Lords, you know, that would the home of cricket. But for it to be at Southampton, when you consider what the world's going through with COVID, uh, when you consider what India is going through with COVID, you know, our heart goes out to what they're going through as we sit down in New Zealand with, you know, we can name the number of people that have had COVID down here on, you know, a couple of hands. So to see the tragedy in India and to know that that's where their players are coming from, this has been a real ray of hope for New Zealand fans at a time where it's pretty scary kind of what's happening around the rest of the world. But um, so we'll put it in context and we'll understand that um, it would have meant a lot to India if they'd won as well with everything that they're going through. So, yeah, will it build, will it build a, a legacy which will last forever? No, it'll be, it'll you know, hopefully it's the first chapter in New Zealand actually knowing how to win titles um, and we can build on it from there. But um it's at least introduced test cricket to a whole bunch of people who thought it was this really boring. I mean, it's still pretty boring sometimes, test cricket. Uh, but at least it created a whole bunch of stories and, and um, memorable moments for a bunch of people who were so used to being the bridesmaid instead of the bride. Uh, we'll finish the podcast there. Just absolutely brilliant. The way we started with Tim Payne, we ended uh, talking about India. That is the absolute right way to do a podcast on New Zealand's incredible victory. Peter, thank you very much for coming on. Pleasure.